I'm going to talk a lot about fake news, Russian intervention, um, how to spot it, and all that. But before I get started, first I want to uh, give a shout out to my research assistant, Madison Lachule, who is an undergraduate at LSU. She and uh, two others of her colleagues have helped put together um, uh, a really cool website uh, that I want to show you. In fact, I want to preview a relaunch and a redesign of our website, detectfakenews.com, which uh, we think, as best I can tell, is the only website in the, we know of that uh, is, be, is a curated collection of material on, on research, analysis, and news developments on fake news and Russian intervention, the 2016 election, what's unfolding in the 2020 campaign, and I'll show you a little bit of that. So I don't want to bury the lead, so we'll start there. And, um, aha, clicker. Well, we won't start. So this gives you a sense of the site. This is our homepage, Fight Fake News, detectfakenews.com. Uh, we took a cartoon from The Advocate that we liked a lot a little while ago. Uh, Walt Handelsman had a, had a funny cartoon about just what was going on uh, during the 2016 uh, campaign. Uh, this is our resource, LSU, the Manship School's resource guide to um, fake news, um, a lot of information. We ought to go the other way. Don't you love technology? Isn't it great? Okay, so you think it's working? Yes. Ah, oh, that's good news. Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is our misinformation, disinformation uh, page. Gives you a sense of, you know, what, I guess I can even point with this thing. This gives you a sign, uh, some definitions. Uh, we see this as part of our job just to educate. We talk about, there's a whole page here on rumor mongering, filter bubbles, how information moves through society, why we kind of yearn for explanations and fall for rumors, what happens with so-called information cascades, which is a fancy, fancy word for echo chambers. Uh, deep fakes, we'll come back to this in a minute or two, but deep fakes are those uh, manipulated videos in which um, you've seen the Nancy Pelosi drunk video was an example. It was a really bad deep fake video. They've gotten much, much better. And you can get a sense of, uh, we'll talk a little bit about how they're done. This gives you a sense of uh, the, the deep learning, machine learning that happens with, with video uh, and then to produce a completely, completely manufactured um, uh, synthesized video. We'll come back and to that in a minute. What the risks are, what the privacy issues are, and where the law comes in, which is frankly the law doesn't help. If somebody makes a deep fake video about you, um, it can be quite damaging. Um, oftentimes I'm asked about, about fake news in Louisiana. Um, this is a slide I've had for a while about an example that actually happened in Louisiana several years ago. I don't pretend that it's news. I just want to take it apart a little bit because it's illustrative of how a fake news attack happens. This actually occurred. It was fake. And it was brought to you by the St. Petersburg Internet Research Agency um, on the left. 
uh, and a plant in Centerville, Louisiana, in St. Mary Parish um, called Columbian Chemicals. As best we know, it was an attack, a probe really, launched by a, a private Russian group with ties to Putin, uh, designed to just kind of scare this little rural community where a large carbon black manufacturing plant is. And it worked for a few hours. This is the CNN homepage. Shows a photograph of an explosion. It's a plant explosion in Centerville causes panic. This was tweeted out. This, this homepage is completely fake. It was confected by, as best we know, the Russian Internet Research Agency and was distributed in a tweet storm and a, and a bot storm. Just um, trolls and bots. Uh, trolls are real people. Bots are manufactured dissemination on Twitter and other social media to try to get the word out early in the morning of 9-11-2014. This was a photograph of an explosion in Centerville. Again, it's tweeted out. One clue to this, the uh, phoniness of this is the tweet, the tweet name, the username is uh, Greg Spicy. We're not quite sure if Greg Spicy exists, but this was put to rest in a few hours, mostly by the media in New Orleans, who after running a a few trying to run down this, this explosion, um, uh, decided it was a hoax. How did it happen, though? It just didn't happen on 9-11. And this is kind of fundamental about how a lot of fake news attacks begin. There's a little bit of a, of a constellation, I call it, a month or so before the attack on 9-11 in 2014. The Internet Research Agency, as best we know, set up a page on Facebook called Louisiana News, designed to draw in anybody who was interested in Louisiana News. There was a Wikipedia entry all ready to go on the explosion. There was a tweet storm, as I just mentioned. All of this was designed to build a community of interest around Centerville, St. Mary, and Louisiana. And because it's not that far from either Baton Rouge or New Orleans, uh, it was it was, the hope was that New Orleans media would focus on this and Baton Rouge media would focus on this. And like I say, TV stations and uh, print media did. And by early afternoon, about four hours after it started, it was pretty much over. Does fake news still, is fake news still a thing? Absolutely. Last week I had my students in my class, I teach over at the Honors College, on media manipulation broadly looking at how information moves through social media. I had them uh, find a fake news story and document how they found it, how long it took, what it had to say. This is a fake news story. It took them a matter of minutes, by the way, uh, to find an example. This is a fake news story about um, some kind of African blood uh, genetic composition that resists the coronavirus. Uh, it's based on a patient who recovered relatively quickly in Africa. But there's nothing about African blood type or any of the rest of this stuff. It was completely, completely confected. This is another story. It's made the internet several different times. Uh, uh, Malia Obama has been busted for smoking dope uh, on, the t on the roof of the uh, uh, US Embassy in Madrid. Not true. She had some White House trinkets. Uh, she was trying to peddle on eBay and elsewhere. That's not true either. Uh, as far as we know, the only thing really true about her is she lives a quiet life as a Harvard undergraduate. She's a junior. But these, were, these happen constantly about her. Um, let me shift gears a little bit and talk about um, where we came from from the 2016 election. Although the Louisiana attack in Centerville was 2014, it built steadily through the campaign of 2016. And if you read the first part of the Mueller report, which focuses on in Russian interference, it pretty much documents what the New York Times did in 2018 of kind of a systemic overview of exactly how uh, Russians primarily, although there were some other countries as well, interfered or tried to interfere in our camp, in our election. Uh, so the plot to subvert an election came out in September of uh, 2018. The Mueller report, we all know, came out last year. 
part one is my main focus. I always tell my students I don't give a wit about collusion in the Trump campaign in Russia, but I do care a lot about uh, foreign interference and intervention in our electoral systems. And the Mueller report, this is largely overlooked and forgotten about, but part one is a couple hundred pages. It's quite thorough, it documents quite completely, even with redacted provisions, it, uh, it documents quite well in a narrative form exactly what happened. Um, two other books are worth mentioning. Hillary Clinton has a chapter on real news and fake news, and it is very well done at explaining why uh, the Russians would want to kind of bloody her nose, as somebody said. Uh, one of the writers who looked at, uh, uh, kind of a Russian-American writer who uh, took a look at the campaign. Uh, they didn't expect anything like what they got. Uh, Catherine Hall Jameson, a fairly prominent political scientist, came out with a book last year in which she believes in the last weeks of the 2016 campaign, undecideds were tipped against Hillary Clinton because of, because of WikiLeaks, other Russian interference. It's a, it's a fairly persuasive case, not everybody buys it, but Cyber War by uh, Kathleen Hall Jameson, who is well known for, for studying voter attitudes and voter impact on outcomes at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, believes that it actually did have an effect <coughs> in 2016. What we do know, whether you agree with Catherine Jameson or not, what we do know is that fake news is much more widely circulated than real news. It's, it's still true. This looks at data of some of the big fake news stories uh, in 2016 from August until the election in November. And you can't see it very well, but this shows that the amalgam of uh, collection of fake news stories uh, moved through 8.7 million impressions and, and views where mainstream news in that same period, August to November, was 7.3 million. What were those stories? They were pretty famous ones. If you were following the fake news trajectory, the Pope endorsed Trump, which was probably the biggest, almost a million, a million impressions and page views. Uh, I love these headlines, but this is very, very much a fake news headline. WikiLeaks confirms capitals. Hillary sold weapons to ISIS then drops another bombshell, exclamation, breaking news. Uh, one of the formulas for fake news is to say, is to say developing, follow us for more information, uh, or just like this one here. Um, just read the law, colon. Hillary is disqualified from holding any federal office. Um, uh, it's over, colon. Hillary's ISIS email just leaked, and it's worse than anyone could have imagined. These are classic fake news bait. So watch for that. Why do people write fake news? During the 2016 election, a lot of people wrote fake news from Macedonia. And they did it as a cottage industry to make a few bucks. And uh, after the election was over, they pretty much folded up their camp. BuzzFeed discovered this story, actually. And they, they and a few other media organizations went to Macedonia and tracked down the, the actual little industrial park office where they were just pounding away manufacturing fake stories. Why do they do it? If, you get a, if, if Google had no filters back then, at least certainly not effective ones, and they could put it up on the internet and get a slice of, of ad commissions that Google would put next to the article. Uh, so they could make money. They wanted to see if it would go viral. They wanted to sow confusion, like Centerville, Louisiana. And they might want to test political views just to see what reaction might be for or against a candidate or an issue. How to spot it. The headlines can be a giveaway. Um, but I try to tell people, and I've left cards on your tables. You can take them home in this neat portable little, portable little fold up, fold out. Essentially, you want to identify the source, check the information, if you don't see it on reputable news sites, it's probably fake. Cut and paste paragraphs and quotes to see if anybody else has picked it up. Uh, if they're quoting people, 
it's a good reason. It's a good way. A good a good effort. It's it's worth your time to check at least one of these things. Check to see who that person is and how they would know. Are they even independent people? Are they uh, independent experts? Or are they somehow connected to the story? I always tell people to check the URL, the address at the top of the, of the web page. This is an old example, but this was a fake story. And if you look carefully at this, it purports to be a story from ABC News' web page. However, the one on the left is fake. The URL says abcnews.com.co. .co is the country code for Columbia. Where on the right, it's abcnews.go.com. That's the real one. But that's, again, a fairly, 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 um, fairly low grade trick. Do these quotes turn up elsewhere when you copy and paste them? Has the New York Times picked them up? Has AP picked them up? Has, I see Mark Ballard here. Has the Advocate picked them up? Anything that would suggest that these are being picked up by edited news sites. Check the images. Right? Have they been doctored? Basically, you can draw, drag and drop it into Google Images. This is a lot of steps. And almost everybody says, oh, Len, are you kidding me? We have to do all this? If you just did one or two of these to a suspicious story, <coughs> you, it might save you the embarrassment of, of, of being hooked into a fake story. What's happening, however, is that most readers on social media don't even read the story. They find it enticing. They think, well, I don't know if this is true, but it might be true. I'm going to pass it on. And off it goes. And that's how that April on the Pope endorsing Trump, that's how that got almost a million views. Let's talk for a few minutes about deep fakes. Deep fakes are video. The technology to copy somebody's um, head movements, facial movements, voice are, is quite good now. And as a consequence, you can make copies of world leaders because there's so much video, so much real video that can be aggregated and used by a machine learning computer to just copy and copy and copy and copy and layer on all the things that compose um, the North Korean leaders uh, voice and head movements, uh, Trump's voice and head movements, uh, and Obama, right? They're, getting, they're much more difficult to detect because the, constant, the, the technology is constantly evolving and photos and video have been altered using face swap and voice modulation. Now, is there a way we can, we can hook into that link, pull in that link? We've had a little bit of a technology gap, so let's see if we can pull up that particular. Uh, while he's getting started, this is a Berkeley professor, I'll explain who he is in a minute, who's talking in a... <coughs> more with the Motley Fool, and I've been to a very crowded CES for eight straight years you know This now. is an ad, so skip that. And I can that. honestly say that there's one thing I'm seeing this year that I've never seen before, and that is one technology. All right, this dancer is a real dancer. Machine learning is basically recreating the, the movements in this one. Stop it for a second. Can you stop it? This is Hani Farid at Ber UC Berkeley. He is one of the leading experts in the country on deep fake and particularly deep fake detection technology, deep fake replication technology. And he's working with uh, a, a consortium of universities and researchers who are focused on trying to find a tool that eventually we all could use to detect a deep fake video. Because you might want, the, the, he'll, he talks about this in a second. Go ahead and, and play this. Almost impossible to debunk. She's at Boston University's law school. She's a privacy law expert. I'll come back to her in a minute. Danielle Citron. Well, I don't think that's likely. I also don't think it's out of the question. He's talking about a. And that is enough to keep me up at night. 
the margins are very, very thin. The last national election here in the U.S. was 80,000 votes in three states. You don't have to fool tens of millions of people. I don't think it's fake will become a big political issue. He disagrees. This guy's at USC. a low rumor before an IPO. I think a lot of these things were problems already. Um, and so it's unclear to me how much machine learning really, you know, adds to those problems. I find it very difficult to sort of believe that there's That's real. So unique, that was not. Devastating about video. Right now, what we are focusing on is developing forensic techniques to protect world leaders from deep fakes. We are particularly worried about how the Donald Trumps, Theresa May, and Angela Merkels of the world, how their likeness will be used to disrupt elections and incite potential violence in countries by creating fake content. There's some fun and entertaining, interesting applications, but there is a weaponization of the technology. And I simply advocate that we as technologists, we acknowledge it, and we start thinking not after the fact, but before the fact, how can we start putting some safeguards in place? This is an excerpt of a piece done by Nova in, on PBS. That's good. And just go back to the slide. Oh. Now, the weaponization. The woman on the right is a young, talented Indian journalist who was writing aggressively uh, political stories about uh, some Indian politics in, in certain parts of the country. So one day, after a series of investigative pieces and other, other uh, kind of successful um, scoops, uh, a pornographic video was made with her face on it. And it wasn't, it wasn't a bad cut. It actually was quite believable and it went viral and essentially destroyed her career. Um, this comes up in a series of legal studies that are being done on what, what could the law have done for this invasion of privacy? Leave, a lot, leave, aside, leave it alone India for, leave aside the India question, but what could it have done here in the United States? And the woman you saw a minute ago, the professor in her office with the glasses is at Boston University Law School and she said essentially, she's a privacy expert in this country, she says not very much. So what is being done? You saw Honey Farid, he's the Berkeley professor who's working on uh, trying to come up with a detection, particularly for world leaders. Um, human eyes can judge a, f a deep fake of a face about half the time, and an, a neutral network tool goal is to get to 100%. They're not quite there yet. Adobe recognizes that they are, have a big role to play in this. Uh, because they've created so much uh, photo, photo handling software and manipulation that uh, it's, it, they should be involved. Uh, so what can you do in the meantime? Check for blinking eyes, blur, and uh, lip sync movement. Uh, check the source and listen for unnatural speech patterns. Blinking eyes don't happen very easily in machine learning, but we all naturally blink our eyes. We think nothing of it. But if you see a video and the, the face is not blinking an eye, that's not an absolute certainty that it's fake. Some people don't blink very much, but it's a question. Check the source and listen for unnatural speech, speech patterns. And uh, I guess we all cross our fingers that UC Berkeley, MIT, and a few other groups in this consortium uh, pull off some kind of public detection software. <coughs> so, I usually end with this note. This was done in the fall of, um, of 18. This is a real newsstand uh, in New York City on 42nd Street, actually. And uh, it was taken over as a project by the Columbia Journalism Review and one of uh, the prominent New York uh, advertising agencies. They, they took it over for a day, and they left the bottles and candy uh, where it always is. And all those publications 
thanks to the advertising agency's funding, were reprinted versions of fake news stories found on the internet. And some of the headlines were, Texas recognized as a Mexican state. It was the magazine cover of a title that looked like New York Magazine. Uh, Painkillers in our water supply. It was a magazine that looked like The Economist. And they were, it went on and on like this. So people are always confused. Is this fake? No, this is a real building. This is all fake. This was all fake. These were all fake. So were these. And the journalism review stood back 50 feet, 75 feet, and watched to see what the reaction was. And essentially, nobody was surprised or confused. They've written about this. Um, but it's an experiment to just give you a sense of how much is out there. And it's kind of fun. And, and it was an interesting photograph. So I'm going to stop there. We've covered a, the landscape a bit. I promised to end by 1245. And I think I'm on, on time and under budget. So that's good. And we've got time for questions. Mark. Go ahead, Mark. Well, in this kind of era of angry partisanship, uh, people seem conducive to kind of uh, believe the worst. And how does that play into the pro proliferation of fake news? Oh, I think it. I think it, uh, fake news is is a is a is a tool. Oh, I'm sorry. I did say I'd repeat the question. Uh, Mark asked in this, in, let me see if I got this right, in this kind of climate of uh, a very divisive political climate, to what, to what degree does fake news play into this polarization and highly politicized um, uh, division in our country? And their willingness to believe that it's not fake. Oh, and, and people's willingness to believe that this is true, uh, that fake news is in fact true. Look, there's a lot of... Um, I teach this almost from day one in my classes. There's a lot of confirmation bias. And people are looking for some reinforcement of their beliefs, whether they are grounded in fact or not. And as a consequence, a lot of fake news takes off because of this basic guidance that we have in our mind. I don't know if this is true, but it might be true. And it certainly rings true to me, and off it goes. Uh, some of you may remember about three years ago, we had a, um, a fake news master come to talk to the school and the community one night, Cameron Harris. He confected a story of, uh, in, I think it was September or early October of 2016. He confected a story that ended up on the front, the whole escapade ended up on the front page of the New York Times. And what Cameron did was he wanted to know if he could essentially make a viral story. He was a political consultant, fresh out of uh, college at Davidson, sat down at his kitchen table, tried a couple of ideas. They didn't really go anywhere, but then he hit on it, the third idea that the New York Times called a masterpiece. <laughs> Cameron sat down and he basically wrote a story that said a, a security man on pat patrol in a warehouse in Columbus, Ohio had spotted a pallet with boxes on it marked ballots. This is Ohio, Battleground State, 2016. In those boxes were pre-marked absentee ballots for Hillary Clinton. And he wrote this story. He wrote this story, hundreds and hundreds of ballots pre-marked for Hillary Clinton. He found them, it was the story, and the, he had all the right headlines, the story's breaking, follow, come back, I'll have more detail, all that stuff. He knew it was completely fake. It took off. Uh, he had bought a URL for five bucks on a URL, URL website, bought this URL for five bucks. Within hours, he had done this one evening, within hours, knowing full well it was gonna be knocked down by Ohio election authorities, uh, within hours, he had six million impressions. Six million impressions, and he made on Google Ads over $20,000 in his commission for all those little ads. For in, in his case, there was, I think, uh, 
shoe polish, hair cream, some other stuff that Google thought was relevant to Hillary Clinton and ballots in Ohio. That's the, po the point. It, it, he bought that URL, by the way, for five bucks. He calls the agency uh, early the next day and he says, what will you give me for the URL now? And the guy says, I will wire you $100,000 for this URL. I'll have it in your bank account by close of business. This is a valuable URL for six million impressions. Are you kidding me? You'll, I'll pay you for this. I'll buy it back. He said, well, let me think about it. He knew it was going to be knocked down. I don't know what he was thinking. By the end of the day, he calls back. It had already been knocked down. And Ohio election authorities had, had, had denied the story, said it was completely fabricated and a hoax. And um, he calls the guy back, says, how much is the URL worth now? He says, oh, it's not worth anything. <laughs> I'm not going to pay anything for it. Uh, but that's the game that people play with this. That's what was going on in Macedonia. To be, get back to Mark's point, we are such a divided society that people, in his case, the, the, the Trump supporters ate up the Hillary Clinton, ate up the Hillary Clinton bias, right? It confirmed their beliefs that she would cheat. And what he based this on was that he had seen real polling data during the 2016 presidential debates in which the, the basic uh, idea that Hillary would cheat, steal the election, and remember Trump was in the mode where he was not going to accept the result, he wasn't sure he was going to accept the result, all of that. So that's when Cameron thought, well, let me make up this story, because it basically plays to all our biases. And the rest is history. So I think this is a big issue. I think, I don't think, it's just me. It's obviously the Russians think this is a ripe environment for divisive social media to play into people's biases. And you know, what happens in these echo chambers, and this is, we talk about this a lot in class, is the more you are in a group that believes like you do, the more you cling to your ideas. In fact, the stronger your opinions are when you are talking to people who are like-minded. Never mind the facts. Only when somebody, some really respected authority or authoritative outlet knocks down a story do people start to say, oh, maybe I'll think about this. Does that answer your question? Other questions? John. Uh, earlier in the talk, you mentioned uh, the people in Macedonia that had created the story. And you said that since then, That's a good question. John is asking, what has Google, and I think by implication, Facebook, Twitter done to try to kind of weed out all of this? They have put up various safeguards and filters to try to spot this. They have a real life room at Facebook literally moderating and trying to find trouble. I must say, this is an example. Remember when we talked about Centerville, Louisiana? and we talked about a Facebook page called Louisiana News. When I first started teaching my class in 2018, this is two, this is now, that page was put up in 14. Six years later, that page was still on Facebook. By the time my class was over in the spring of 18, it was taken down. They had gone, Zuckerberg had had to go to Congress. There was a lot of heat on Facebook. They were ramping up some kind of, um, filtering system, which has not really worked, but they have gotten more serious about it as they felt more pressure. So they've done that. Uh, some political ads are being rejected. Uh, there's a few other things that, that have been done. However, one of the things my students noticed just in the last week was that if you label something satire, it doesn't get taken down. So watch for that. Satire is considered free expression. And this is a, a point that's worth mentioning. Uh, I've had it in other presentations, uh, and I didn't really emphasize it here. Our First Amendment freedoms, in this case, are great, but they work against us for this kind of stuff. Because there's very little you can legislate uh, to prohibit. Yes, in the back. Well, 
Well, what, what, what do you mean by trash news? I, I don't know what's, what's, tra what's trash news. The, qu the question seems to be is, is, is if somebody sits down or confects a story at, the, uh, at their kitchen table, is it any different than stuff that comes through a newsroom? Is that what you're talking about? A professional newsroom in which uh, things are taken out of context and whatever? Well, it depends on your view. Uh, uh, very rarely is something completely wrong. There could be a wrong quote. There can be context that's a little, a little distorted. Uh, there can be some other flaws and figure something like that could be wrong in a story. Uh, but uh, I actually think that mo so-called moderated newsrooms in which editors actually work to look at stuff before it goes out do catch more things than you, than you think. Now, if you don't like the, news, the local newspaper or some other newspaper because you just think it's biased and whatever, well, then it's biased. Then I, I can't persuade you. But I actually think that this stuff that's completely made up out of whole cloth is a whole different level than what comes out of the Advocate, the Houston Post, Chronicle, the New York Times, Washington Post, and all the rest of it. That's a whole different level. You may not like it. You may find it biased. We studied bias in my classes, and there's bias all over the place in all mainstream media. But um, I think this stuff that's cranked out by Macedonian spammers trying to make a buck is a whole different level, which is one of the reasons why we're concerned about this. But from the standpoint of actual harm. Actual what now? Actual harm. Harm. Yeah. The kitchen table guy versus the so-called legitimate news source. I'm sorry, so what's the question? What, who, what's more harmful? Yeah. What is well, What's the, the harm? I think the harm, I think if you want, on a high level, look, all, mis, all inaccuracies are harmful, right? They're harmful to the reputation of the writer, the publication, the website, all that. But some people don't care, right? The fake news sites aren't in the business of credibility. They're in the business to make money. So they don't care what harm they create. What happened, what they tried, <clears throat> excuse me, what they tried to put off, pull off in Centerville, they didn't care about their reputation. The Picayune and the local TV stations in New Orleans that eventually did knock it down, they they came to the they basic basically did their job, but the but the outfits that were spinning the stuff about Centerville they didn't care whether people ran for the exits, the EMS was scrambled, somebody could have been somebody could have died while the EMS was attending to essentially a false alarm, they didn't care. That's harm. Okay. Jerry. Well, I, I was just going to append something to your answer. Um, and that is, it seems to me that motivation is another distinguishing factor. Yes. Between the kitchen table person and the legitimate journalist who, as you said, perhaps is lost. But that person's motivation is very different from the kitchen table. That, that's a good point. Motivation is a good point, is a good point, and it differentiates. Uh, the, the profiteer from the publisher. Yes? Um, soon after President Trump took office, uh, there was a New York Times headline that read, Trump White House fears PR problem with nation's drinking water. I do think the nation is concerned, across the nation we're concerned about drinking water. I know particularly here in Louisiana we're concerned about drinking water. Uh, but I don't see it as a PR problem at all. Can you comment on that? Gee, I'd have to look at the whole story. Headlines, you know, headlines are pieces of stories. I don't know, I don't remember that particular headline. I thought you were going to ask me about the lie headline in the New York Times or the one, uh, the one that had such a huge protest within the newsroom that, that the newsroom thought was too sympathetic to the Trump White House. Um, I forget the actual context of it, but the lie headline was in September of 2016, in which Trump backs off his birther, his birther uh, stance. Mm -hmm. He basically pulls back and says, "Well, I get like you know, after all these years of peddling the idea that Obama was not born in in the United States, he just backs off it." 
And there's a whole debate about whether the New York Times should have accused Donald Trump, then a candidate, of lying. They did in a headline. That's what. I, that's that's the headline I was thought you were going to ask about. Well, I actually was, think it was a mistake. Yeah. Well, that particular story went on to talk about uh, just the degree of uh, compromised water resources throughout the country. Well, and that's a real story. Yeah. That's certainly a real story. It's a health issue. It's a PR issue, and everything else. Why they put PR in the headline? Um, I don't know. I did work on page one, and we worked on headlines. I would say about half of our focus was on the seven headlines on that page. Yeah. Uh, they're very hard to write. I come from experience. I was not a headline writer by training, but I had to weed out the ones that didn't work and try to make them try out to make alternatives fit. It's really hard. But it's uh, a bad headline is, is just a bad headline. And I'd have to look at the whole story to understand. Leaving aside the uh, fractions of ad revenues, six million impressions when they are so casual or so forth, it's a gee whiz number, but at the end of the day, how, how much do, do those impressions mean to the public? It is, uh, in the, really yes, in the scheme of things, in the scheme of things, uh, the question was six million impressions, how, how big, a, how, how significant of that in the scheme of all impressions? It's not even a. It's not even a single decimal, a single point. It, but the question that becomes the question really is: Yes, in the in the huge river of information that flows through our lives, where does fake news stand? It, it's it, it's a fraction, right? It's a fraction of a fraction. On the other hand, it the potential of uh, the potential for harm and confusion is significant. And the, the, the other thing that I think is at work here is that it erodes trust, generally. And so I, I'm sure everybody in this room has a conversation that goes something like, you know, it's so confusing to me now, I don't know who to trust. I just don't know where to, re where to, where to get news that I can trust. And I hear that in my neighborhood, I hear that at school, I hear that outside of Louisiana. I hear that everywhere. And that, that's the devil's playground. And that's where this stuff, this stuff can be weaponized and can fester and grow and, and threaten. You know, I think what's, I always ask the question, well, I shouldn't tell you, say this because I haven't given a, an exam. What's the threat here? What is at stake, I ask in an essay question. And the students get this. They get that, okay, yes, it's a fraction of, what, of all the information that we're working with, but the threat here to our democratic system is quite, is quite real. And by the way, Putin's back. That's clear from this week. And although Putin doesn't use a computer, he certainly has friends who know a lot about him. It's true, he doesn't use a computer. Um, and he's very facile at this. And I think actually 2016 exceeded beyond, beyond Russia's wild imaginations. If you want to have fun, watch a Megyn Kelly interview. Just Google Megyn Kelly on YouTube uh, when she's at NBC. She goes and does a two-part um, two uh, interview, one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not quite sure why he agreed to do it. But he agrees to sit down. This is after Mueller has indicted 13 people uh, for confecting fake news and, and the Internet Research Agency. Mueller gets onto this fairly quickly. It was well known. By the time the Mueller investigation is up and running, the first thing he does is he goes back to that, that building on the left, which they're no longer in because there's been so much attention in St. Petersburg, Russia, and he finds he indicts them. And he names in that indictment, two of the 13 are women who travel through Louisiana. Uh, and they travel through several other states uh, for political intelligence. I don't know what that was all about. It was after Centerville. But Louisiana is one of the six states. They go to Nevada. They go to, they go to, they go to Las Vegas. They go to New Orleans. They go to Chicago. They go to New York. It's all listed in the first indictment. Still a mystery as to what happened. What happened. But they're back.
Thank you.